there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. Honey? Lens. Oh, you're filming. Yes, Lens. So, my question to you is what happened this morning? <laughs> we found out we're pregnant. We found out we're pregnant. <laughs> Each year, around 136 million babies are born. Motherhood can be exciting. It can be a blessing. It can be a dream come true. This new chapter can be the most fulfilling time in your life. But for one in five new mothers, it can be something else entirely. As soon as I found out I was pregnant, I started um, becoming very anxious. Um, my OCD, which I have a history of, hit the wall. I quit my job, I stayed at home, and I obsessed. Two weeks before I was due, I went in for a checkup with uh, my OB, and she said she's going out of town on my due date. And I said, I can't have anybody else deliver my baby but you. So we scheduled for me to be induced. And uh, that's when the, the nightmare kind of just took over. I was in labor for 38 hours. I remember Leaving the hospital, I was really scared. I was nervous to go home. Um, so we did it, we went home, and um, I remember we were sitting on the couch in the living room, and I was holding him. I was so tired, and all of a sudden, it was like a click, like this. And I was like, oh my god, here we go. I have postpartum depression. <laughs> After we did our first interview, I realized that I didn't know enough about my experience with postpartum depression. Um, I knew I had it bad, and I knew that um, I was missing out a lot on life. Um, I went on to study about postpartum depression um, afterwards and, and really learned the different types of postpartum depression and what I had. So I realized I wasn't better, and I realized I had a lot more work to do. So after the interview, I, I set forward to, to do some more work um, to get better. About 800,000 to a million women every year are gonna experience some form of mood or anxiety disorder after they give birth. And this has become a public health issue. Postpartum depression cuts across lines of socioeconomic status, cuts across lines of culture, of age, of gender. There were days where I remember calling my older sister and I said, I really need you to talk to me right now because I really feel like I could go upstairs and get the gun. I'm like, I just feel so lost. I feel like I don't know who I am. There are lots of different ways in which postpartum depression can look and how the symptoms can look. It used to be that the baby blues was the umbrella term for every kind of postpartum depression you could imagine. And we now know that this is not a continuum necessarily. Uh, in fact, 
we look at the baby blues actually as normal postpartum adjustment because about 75 to 80 percent of women, that's around three out of four women, are going to experience these very mild, very fleeting kinds of symptoms. And most women will go on to do quite well without any need for any kind of medical intervention. But then about 15% of women are going to experience postpartum depression with anxiety. And that's probably the most common way in which this can look. I started like uh, panicking and having some anxiety attacks, like on the way home. Even though we were in the car and it was so great, it would come in waves. I just had all this pressure. I had to be this perfect parent. I had to maintain a house. I still had to be a wife. Um, I had to take care of my in-laws, cook and clean and, and do all of this with the new baby. And it was just impossible. And I think my personality, I have to be in control of everything. And I, I couldn't control it all. And I think I just, uh, I, somewhere along the line, I just gave up and I let it all overcome me. A lot of moms go untreated because once we're a mom, we think that being a good mom means we have to take care of our baby first. And we don't think we should, we should think about ourselves anymore. Women will experience things like sleeplessness, disruptions in appetite, feelings of inadequacy, guilt, a sense of helplessness. Um, there's a lot of feeling of incompetence about being a mom. I just felt so hyper-responsible for every little moment and just assumed that I was failing her at every moment. And then that transformed into this singular thought that just kept playing in my mind, which was, this girl would be better off with another woman as her mother. I was at the place where I couldn't take care of her. I mean, I literally like wanted to be in bed with the covers over my head. Uh, I couldn't muster the, the ability. I, like, I just, not only did I could not take care of her, I didn't want to. I think a really good way to put it for people who don't understand is there's like a sheet of glass between you and your infant. Even when you hold them and touch them, the connection is still not there. I felt like I needed, like mentally I knew I needed to bond with him and he needed to see me smiling and it was important, but I didn't feel any of that. Like I didn't feel like smiling. I didn't feel like cuddling with him. I didn't feel like, like the things that I guess I should have felt. And I just was kind of like, okay, Where's that, oh, you know, overwhelming, magical sensation that everybody had told me about? People go like, oh, it's so fulfilling. I go, I don't know, man. This feels just very scary for me. I don't feel fulfilled. I feel like I, and I did. I had a moment where, I mean, I fantasized about leaving all the time. I was just like, I'm gonna pack my bags. I'm gonna get on a plane and I'm out of here. But I had a moment where I had gone and done groceries and I was sitting in my car and I was just like, I just want to die. I don't want to go home. I don't want to, I don't want to see the kids. I don't want to see Dave again. I cannot do this and I don't know how to stop feeling the way I feel. I don't know what's going to change. Like when it's gonna change, but like I was convinced that I just wanted to die, you know? About, oh, I'd say three to five percent of women are going to experience postpartum depression with obsessive compulsive behaviors and or thoughts and images. I constantly just obsessed about everything that I was doing wrong or that I couldn't be with him. Um, and I think I was just in a constant suffering mode. Most postpartum depressions present as a very anxious depression, and probably a good percentage, maybe 50% of women with postpartum depression have anxiety that they're gonna do something to harm the baby. And I remember walking up the stairs with her in my arms and thinking if I just smashed her head into the wall, we could both sleep. And I thought, well, this, this doesn't seem like normal thinking. It was almost as if there was another part of me that was, 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 was coming forward. And I mentioned it to my sister-in-law and my husband, and they said, thank you for telling us. Um, and then I don't know that I experienced a whole lot of feelings after that of that kind. Then I sort of went into this 
I just want to die. I can't do this. I can't cope with this. It's too much. I'm overwhelmed. I felt myself going deeper and deeper into a hole. And your friends think they're being helpful by letting you be because you are starting this new life. And I felt more and more isolated. I'm a very social person. And I remember just sitting here on the couch, looking out at the world and just going, oh my God, what have I done? When Tanya Newbold shared her story with director Jamie Lynn Lipman, they realized what an important issue postpartum depression was, and yet how seldom it was talked about. At that time, I uh, had come out of my postpartum depression, but it really struck me how intense it was. And I thought, you know what? More people need to know about this. I couldn't find information on it. So then we ended up speaking. And even though you didn't have it, you had a passion towards what other moms go through. And we decided to go on this journey together. Here I have this baby that I wanted more than anything in the world. And I felt no connection with her. And it was awful. And I'm looking at her and all I'm thinking is, I want my life back. I don't, I don't want this. Why would anyone put themselves through this? And then the way you feel about feeling that, because you want to love your child more than anything. And so it's, it's just awful. And I remember thinking, if I just throw her over the balcony, it'll be done. And I would never, ever touch her. And thank God, I've come to understand that these are thoughts that happen. And it's horrifying. But it's like I remember, you know, just her screaming and me walking into the other room just going, oh my God, I can't do this, I can't do this, I don't know what to do. And James had to work full time. And I had help, it wasn't like I was completely by myself, but just I couldn't wait to like leave. I would just leave and go to the mall and just go walk around and I would see mothers with their babies that were newborn and they're holding them and walking with them and I'm thinking, why don't I wanna do that? Why do I want to just be by myself? I want to distinguish for you the difference between these kinds of thoughts and images and what we see in postpartum psychosis. Because in this kind of presentation where women are having these intruding images and thoughts, they're very disturbed by them. They know something is wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, most women will say to you, what kind of a mom am I that I could think such horrible things about my baby? When we look at postpartum psychosis, women are not aware that there is something foreign about their thoughts. One or two out of every thousand women are going to have postpartum psychosis. Although it's rare, it is a break with reality. It's characterized by what we call hallucinations. Many times they have religious overtones. I thought that Jeff was Jesus. I thought I was the bride of Christ. I thought the world was coming to an end. If anyone suspects a postpartum psychosis, we cannot send them home. We have to take care of them as if they're having a heart attack. Almost six years after the birth of her son, Hunter, Lindsay still suffers from postpartum depression and post-traumatic stress disorder surrounding the trauma of his birth. She's agreed to give us an inside look at her path to recovery. I'm terrified of the world knowing my real story. I'm terrified of them seeing what I'm going through to try to recover from this. But just by reaching out to you in one email, it was kind of like my lifeline to you. It was like, it was like, hi, <laughs> you know, here I am stuck. What's going on out there in the world? You know, I'm ready. So you and I met at a coffee shop and when you told me you wanted me to be a part of this film, maybe come on as a producer, it changed my life forever. I go to Dr. Bressler for EMDR to work on the trauma of um, my delivery and everything that happened. It was a really hard time that for some reason I'm not able to recover from. If there's trauma that is continued to be experienced, there are new techniques like EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's a very modern technique for treating post-traumatic stress. And a lot of women with PPD really basically have post-traumatic stress as well. And those issues need to be treated. 
I just had an EMDR treatment with Dr. Bressler. It was my second one, and it was really intense. And I feel really emotional right now, and I feel really tired. And um, I feel more relaxed. Uh, we worked on something that I needed to get out for a while, which is the trauma surrounding Hunter's birth. <laughs> and uh, all the chaos that came with that. The first two days or three days of between being in the hospital and coming home was, I remember, like magical. You know, we got in the car, we were so excited. Um, but very, very quickly there was a shift in Lindsay and uh, I could tell that there was a huge depression that had just set in. There's just confusion. You know, you wake up and all of a sudden this person that you knew is no longer there. Lindsay as a person kind of disappeared. So we didn't have a relationship uh, for a long time um, because that was there. And I didn't feel like there was really any room. There wasn't, there was no room for me. It was everything that she was feeling and had to go through related to, to Hunter and the baby 100%. How did you handle it for yourself? Um, that's a good question. How did I handle it for myself? Um, I don't know. You know, I put on a lot of weight. I ate a lot. Um, uh, it was, it's the first time anybody's asked me how I dealt with it. Um, I don't know. You know, Lindsay uses the term, you, you just get through it one step in front of the other. I never thought about myself and getting through it. I just kind of lived through it. Um, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, I still today feel like I have uh, resentment inside and in that, you know, I missed out on something. Um, you know, I so want another child, but I know that's not going to happen. Uh, it's life, I guess. I'm, I'm thankful for, for what I have, and I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, Lindsay's made it through and that Hunter's okay. Um, but how have I dealt with it? I don't know that I really have. I don't. I've taken care of quite a few uh, patients with postpartum depression, and I think one of the most important things is just to understand some of the factors that may be contributing to it. Um, obviously, nutritional issues, because the baby has a buffet, and if it needs calcium, it takes it out of the mother's bones, okay? And whatever nutrients the baby needs, they get. So. By the time the baby's delivered, the mother may need a lot of nutritional support at that point. The second thing is to realize that often depression is the crash that occurs after a long period of unrelenting stress. And being pregnant is a very stressful situation, particularly the first and third trimesters. While you're under stress, you're putting out adrenal corticosteroids, stress hormones, things of that sort, and you're coping with it as best you can. But as soon as that stress is over, now you're gonna pay. Obviously, the things that are most conducive to postpartum depression are the sleep deprivation associated with parenting, in addition to the hormonal change that occurs after delivery. The act of delivering is so exhausting. It's, it's been compared to running several marathons continuously without resting. And uh, so you're exhausted, but yet you cannot sleep. The sleep deprivation was really hard. But then at seven weeks, he started sleeping 10 hours through the night. And that's about when I realized there was something wrong with me, because I was awake. I'm like, how is the baby asleep and I'm awake? Like, this doesn't make sense. And I think that was the first trigger that, like, something wasn't quite right. After you deliver, uh, you're lactating. So your prolactin level goes up, and your estrogen doesn't quite kick back in. And uh, so estrogen and progesterone are both, um, um, you know, sort of at lower levels. I breastfed, so that was hard. He didn't really take to it. And when he did, all he wanted to do was nurse. 
constantly. I remember, I think it was the second night, um, I stayed up all night nursing him over and over and, you know, an hour at a time or he'd stop and latch back on and stop and latch back on and I, I got no sleep. I was not prepared for how difficult or time intensive or emotionally draining it would be. I didn't know what to expect. That's the thing that's scary about having your first child is you don't know what you're gonna get. You don't know how you're gonna feel. You know you're gonna be excited and elated and you're gonna feel love, but there's a lot of surprises. A lot of things that nobody can prepare you for. About a day after I gave birth and I was still recovering from this C-section, everything that was happening to me, all these emotions, I just let them happen. And I didn't question anything until the, the next day, I started hallucinating. I looked over at Lola from across the hospital room, and this voice was like, I'm the devil. I'm the devil, and I'm going to kill you. You know, and I thought, OK, that's a, that's a psychotic thought, you know, and that's not me. So something else in there is saying that. And um, I, didn't, I didn't have any urge to hurt the baby, but it was just like a horrible thought. and a ho I just wanted it to go away really badly. And so it did. And then um, my anxiety came. And I swear to God, I don't think I was ever more scared or more freaked out than coming home from the hospital. In the days and weeks following childbirth, support is critical. Whether it is family, friends, or hired help, extra hands around the house are crucial to getting the new mother the rest she needs and ensuring a smooth transition into motherhood. When I told my mom about how much I was struggling, she said, I don't understand how they're doing it in America. She goes, if you were here in India for the first month, you wouldn't do anything. There's this appreciation of the fact that you've just gone through an extraordinary thing and it's going to take you a while to recover. Ideally, some people will hire a baby nurse. And in Asia, we practice this just about for everybody. Sitting Moon is a concept of uh, postpartum rejuvenation. It's a cycle of the moon. Right, so from the new moon to the full moon and then back to the new moon. So it's roughly taking one month after you give birth to your child uh, in order to properly get well and get back on your feet. Postpartum doulas are usually with clients the first six weeks after they give birth. So we usually follow them home from the hospital. We try to fill the gap from hospital where you have doctors, nurses, pediatricians, and you go home and it's just you and your husband. <laughs> and so it's a nice transitional thing. Something that I never told you was that at six weeks when you came in, I couldn't have done it without you and your help. And you were a huge reason why I'm here today and why I'm overcoming postpartum depression. Without you in the early stages, I just wouldn't have been able to get through it. So thank you so much. You're welcome, baby. I've helped hundreds of women, might be in the thousands now, but out of all of those women, I think Lindsay is probably um, in the top three as far as severity goes. Um, luckily for Lindsay, she had amazing support. She had the best doctor. She had the best husband. She had the best baby, <laughs> really. I mean, Hunter had some massive reflux issues, but he was such a sweet baby. Um, and even with all of that, it was life-threatening. Right now I'm on my way to therapy. Every Wednesday I drop Hunter off at school and I drive 30 to 40 minutes away to see a specific therapist who specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as CBT. And I've done therapy off and on for six years but cognitive behavioral therapy is really interesting because it takes your negative thoughts and teaches you how to see things in a different way, in a more positive way. And that's something that I really need to do, especially with my OCD and my obsessive thoughts. It kind of takes over sometimes. So if I use these tools with cognitive behavioral therapy, it really helps me get through my day. 
Many women feel alone while experiencing postpartum depression. It can be isolating and feel hopeless, but help is out there. The founder of Postpartum Support International, Jane Honigman, published some of her diaries from her own experience with postpartum depression in an effort to reach out to women everywhere and show them that they are not alone. Jane, by the way, is really fascinating. Do you know her story? She had postpartum depression but didn't know that she had it. I read every single one of her diaries. And I just thought, I wish there was more of them. My diaries tell the story of the secret that I held inside um, because of the mistake my husband and I made, uh, having, oh my gosh, sex before marriage. We got caught, as we would say, and we had the baby, but we placed her for adoption. Uh, then we got married and tried to live the, the great dream of, you know, now we have the house, and he has the job, and now we'll have the baby. Had the, has our son, and it was really difficult. Um, for a lot of reasons, but the most important one is the fact that I never acknowledged what had happened to me before. And I uh, pushed it out away, um, discovered that I could move forward. I had another baby. Our daughter was born three years later, and she got ill, and I blamed myself. I had all this guilt. I thought she was going to die. I thought I was being punished because, of course, now I could keep this baby girl, and I'd given up the other baby girl. Um, so it was not nice. At one point, I finally realized that, that maybe what I had experienced had a name and that I had had more than just a really bad time. At a point when your husband finally says to you, you know, if you don't get help, I'm going to divorce you, then it's like, oh, I guess something's really wrong. Jane co-founded Postpartum Education for Parents as a support system for new mothers in her community. She later founded Postpartum Support International, which provides a warm line support service for new mothers who want to talk with an expert about what they're going through. Organizations dedicated to educating communities about perinatal mood disorders gather annually at the California Maternal Wellness Summit. I just got our When the Bell Breaks credit, Visa credit card. Does it we, say credit, does it with Bell Breaks? It says When the Bell Breaks. Oh, wow. Here, right, I'll cross out the number and you can see Lindsay Gerst, When the Bell Breaks Visa card. So we are official. How exciting is that? Well, I mean, getting an opportunity to do this project, I mean, going through postpartum depression was awful. And at the time, I didn't know what I had. I couldn't figure out why I felt the way I felt. And then I realized, like, this is a project that needs to be done. Now I'm fine with it. I get it. And we're going to help people. That's the most important thing. I think for me, why? We keep wanting to go forward is because every time we get an email or read one of the emails on Facebook and all the people who say like wow this is what I have it like you're giving us an outlet and you're giving me a way to feel like I'm not alone because I think as a mom it's like I look at how I look at my girls and I think like the people that I know that have been through this like if we can ease any of that and make it better then it's all worth it I think what you guys might not realize is that the reason why you're doing this film was to help women and you already helped one woman which is me I couldn't go on any longer the living the way I was because it was not really living I was just kind of putting one foot in front of the other and and now you know we're going to this amazing conference in Sacramento and so I'm on this journey um, of like kind of like getting back to the person that I was before, which I never would have done if I hadn't done this film with you guys. So thank you. Oh, you just made me cry. That's, that's so sweet. Bonding and attachment are essentially unidirectional, as commonly conceived. And so a child can become attached to a blanket. But the thing is, for brain development, you need the interaction. You need that reciprocal uh, interaction between the caregiver, between the mother and child, in order for things to proceed normally. Obviously, if their mother's depressed or anxious, that child is not going to get what they need to develop normally, neurobiologically. The California Maternal Wellness Summit brought together many amazing speakers and organizations, including 2020 Mom, PSI, and Jenny's Light. 
My family started Jenny's Light in spring of 2008 after we lost my sister and nephew, Jenny and Graham, to postpartum psychosis. On the day of December 19th, 2007, in Birmingham, Alabama, Jenny went to a gun shop around noon and purchased a handgun. And she brought Graham with her, set him on the counter, um, bought a gun, and he even had the shop owner load the gun for her because she'd never shot a gun before. And he loaded it with two bullets. She just said it was for home defense. And then she got rid of her phone, went back home and uh, made dinner for her husband. But then she uh, took Graham in a blanket and went in the backyard right where her husband was gonna have to walk and just took two shots, uh, one to Graham and one to herself. It was, a, it was beyond what I ever thought could happen. It was the worst day of my life, so. The California Maternal Mental Health Collaborative, also known as 2020 Mom, came to understand really what's happening. Like, why aren't women being screened and diagnosed? And we realized that OBGYNs, you know, we, we joke that they didn't go to school to study this and support the brain. They went to school to support the lower half of the body. And they're also the clinician that's most overworked. And so there really is a capacity issue there. And they're more likely to screen if they have a referral path. So our organization looked for other uh, common denominators during this time. And most women deliver at a hospital and most women have health insurance. So we've engaged hospitals and health insurance companies to, to come to the table and suggest small things that each can do to make a difference to raise awareness. The inspiration for our work came in part from a loss of a mom named Kelly Martinez. She um, was suffering from what we believe to be postpartum psychosis and she took her life in a very tragic way. Um, and when I think about her, I get goosebumps. And she's what has motivated me to keep going. I can definitely tell you about Kelly. Uh, she was the most wonderful woman that I've ever met. Uh, gorgeous, beautiful, stunning. The first time I laid eyes on her, it was a blind date, and uh, just knocked my socks off as soon as I saw her. After that, the sparks flew, and we were married uh, in May of 2006. We started thinking about having a family uh, pretty much, you know, after we got married, we started talking about it and thinking about it. And we knew at some point, but yeah, I think with it, as you ask any parent, you're never really ready. You think you might be ready, but you're not ready. <laughs> Our daughter was born November 14th, 2009. And I first realized something was wrong when Kelly started talking to me about mid to late December. Raul Martinez frequently visits this stretch of the Santa Monica boardwalk. Kelly and I used to like to sit and watch people go by. This spot had special significance for us as a couple, but I also imagined that she would want to sit and watch our daughter play. But Raul now often comes to this spot alone or with his young daughter, Melina. Almost exactly three years ago, his wife Kelly took her own life just months after Melina was born. She hurt herself very violently with a knife and she was not a violent person. Not a violent person at all, wouldn't hurt a fly. You know, it just, it just hurts thinking of the despair, and fear, maybe anger, and who knows what other emotions she might've been going through. My daughter and I have coped, uh, I think pretty well given the circumstances, only because we have such a, a strong support system. Uh, I had a lot of problems for the first six months. And uh, you know, I myself was suicidal uh, twice after my wife died, uh, but I'm glad that you know I had a support system to help me through it. Uh, my daughter, it's been a tough road for her, and uh, I do remember specifically uh, when she was around two, either just before or just after she was two, that uh, you know she would come home and talk to me about mommy. Why don't I have a mommy? And I have to explain to her, you do have a mommy. She's just not here anymore physically. And uh, one day she came home from school and she was walking through our house saying, mommy, mommy, where are you, mommy? Mommy, I can't find you, are you hiding? And uh, it broke my heart. Then we talked about it and I said, well, if your mommy was here, what would you wanna do with her? And she said, I would just wanna sit on the couch and hold her hand and play with her 
and show her my toys and tell her that I love her. And um, that was probably one of the hardest conversations I've ever had. Everyone needs to be educated that postpartum depression can occur. It can occur to anybody. But in fact, if you have had a history of any sort of emotional disorder, someone who's had a history of depression would be at risk, someone who's had a history of a postpartum disorder in the past, someone who is bipolar. That's a patient who really needs to be followed very closely through pregnancy and the postpartum. The woman who perhaps is single with very limited supports or isn't single but has an unsupportive partner, that woman is at risk. So anytime things are less than optimal, these are kind of red flags. We weren't made aware of all the risk factors for postpartum depression, and Kelly actually had a lot of them. Uh, you never would have known it. No one ever put a, a, a checklist in front of us to say, which of these do you feel you might have? Medicine is changing. Uh, doctors are seeing more patients. There's less personal care. Um, a lot of times the person who delivers you sees you postpartum isn't the person who sees you in the office antepartum or postpartum, and thus people sort of fall through the cracks. One of my pet peeves is the lack of universal screening. A lot of OBGYNs are not tuning into it so much, or it's better now than it was, so much better. But even pediatricians, the focus is on the baby, not how are you doing mom, or even how are you doing dad. At no point, from the minute you find out you're pregnant, to when your child graduates from high school, or college, is a woman asked about her mental health. Depression is the number one complication of pregnancy. And it's not screened for across the board, but diabetes, which is not the number one complication, is screened for across the board. It's so tricky because it affects everyone so specifically and, and different. so differently. There's, you know, a whole thing that when you talk about something, you make it disappear. The worst thing we can do is hold it in. Unfortunately, I feel when women go through postpartum depression, there's so much shame around it that they end up holding it in, which I think compounds it and makes it so much worse. Though progress is being made in this field, much more needs to be done. Simple changes to hospital procedures could not only save lives, but prevent the suffering of millions of people. There's lots of treatment options for depression. I think the thing about it is, is what we should never do is pigeonhole one type of treatment. It's been six years now, and although there have been times of, you know, living a pretty decent life and enjoying things. There really has never been a long period of time where I feel like I have been good and enjoying life long enough to really appreciate it. There's good data for fish oils. There is good data for vitamin supplementation, acupuncture, and those type of things can help. It's just the idea of when things aren't helping, how do you keep stepping up the game, so to speak, to intervene? I think it's time for me to do TMS. TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. It is part of what's developing in terms of psychiatry in a field called interventional psychiatry. Just like cardiology primarily required medication for treatment, there are procedures where we can intervene to make the heart function better. Heart and the brain are very similar. They're biologic organisms that require electrical signals to create a rhythm um, and transcranial magnetic stimulation stimulates the part of the brain that is really not functioning well. ECT is a, stands for electroconvulsive therapy. It's traditional shock treatment. For a lot of people, it is a life-saving treatment that is no different than putting the paddles on the heart, kind of resetting the brain, and then giving people another chance at life when they probably might have died from their illness. Okay, so this is set up for TMS. What is that? Um, it's to strap in your head to the back of the chair. Strap in my head to the back of the chair. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start, okay. So there's 56 minutes today. 56 minutes of this. The beginning of my pregnancy coincided with a time of a lot of pressure. You know, 
writing a cookbook is is an enormous task. Basically, I mean, the biggest project I've ever worked on before. We planned to have a home birth, I had a midwife, I had a doula, the whole nine. My mother-in-law was here because my mom lives in India. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I labored at home for three days. And then um, it just got to the point where I wasn't progressing and I had to go to the hospital, which was just kind of heartbreaking because we just had this idea of how it was going to be. Whenever you have this ideal set up, um, when we don't hit that for whatever reason it is, we've been programmed to feel really guilty and ashamed about it. As opposed to, in this situation, hey, maybe there's not an ideal. There's a lot of shame attached to um, postpartum disorders because there's still so much stigma and there's so much reluctance to come out and say something's not right. Everyone expects me to be happy and I'm not. I just cried a lot. I cried a lot after I had him. And I remember the first time my mom, she stayed with me um, up until the time I had him. And then she left after he was born. And I remember she was leaving for the airport. And I was sitting on the couch and my daughter was sitting beside me because her and my daughter were super close. And she was crying. Um, my husband was getting the luggage, taking her out so he can take her to the airport. I was holding Jelani, he was crying, and I was crying. And that's the very last time I remember Jelani as a baby. The next thing live or active I can recall is him in preschool. So I, I guess I escaped. That was my day that I escaped to somewhere. I don't know. I know the memories. I know they're there somewhere. Um, I definitely desire to have them back. I can look at pictures and smile. I'll even ask my husband, you know, was I a good mom? What did we do? I don't know how to describe it. It was, it was just a dark, a dark place. It's pretty terrifying to feel that alone. I definitely believe there's a stigma when it comes to any type of mental issue. There's a stigma in the African-American community. I wasn't even aware of what I was going through. It, wasn't, it didn't even dawn on me that it could be postpartum depression. It's just, you have a problem, fix it, something's wrong, let's get it together and move forward. I guess scary things are not talked about and people want to sweep things under the rug and that seems to be a natural human inclination. But does that really serve us? Women are afraid to talk about their mental illness because of stigma. It's a huge issue that is not discussed. I think society is scared shitless of crazy mothers. You want to be portrayed as, you know, like, somebody that has it together. As long as there's stigma around mental illness, we're gonna have big barriers. And the barriers are the shame, the guilt, the embarrassment that you feel when things are not wonderful. I didn't feel totally right, but I didn't want to admit it because then you feel like you're a failure, you feel like you're a bad mom, you feel like you're a bad wife. Part of the depression is the guilt that goes along with it. I think people forget that mental health is a sickness of the brain which is an organ of the body. And so when you have heart disease, there's no stigma attached to it. When you get cancer, there's no stigma attached to it. When you have a mental health issue, the brain chemistry actually changes. I think we have to look at it as if someone had diabetes, we would say, you know, take insulin, don't do right, this. Right, this right. is a, it, a biochem, your biochemistry right. is just out of whack. As much as I'm sort of anti-medication, I'd say get on an antidepressant, it saved my life. I'm a psychopharmacologist, but if I can avoid medications, of course I would do that. But sometimes that's not possible. Through the course of six and a half years, I have probably tried 20 different medications. So every day I take my thyroid medication. Um, I take 20 milligrams of Vibrant and it's my most important medication. I take five milligrams of Adderall and I don't really feel like it does anything, but I think without it, I'd probably be sleeping standing up. At nighttime, I take Celexa. Celexa is an SSRI and it, that's your basic antidepressant. Um, I take uh, 40 milligrams of um, Celexa. I take Abilify. Abilify is, um, they call it an add-on. 
um, drug. So when you're taking other antidepressants and they're just not working the way that you hope they work, um, you know, my doctor, Dr. Sprego, recommended taking Abilify to kind of push it up and make the other medications work a little more. At night, if I feel really anxious, I take Klonopin. It's really important to take vitamins too because if your levels are off, then antidepressants won't really do its full job. Probably 99% of people that see me in the day would never know what goes on in my body and my mind. You know, I try to put a sparkle in my eye and a smile on my face and I put on some makeup and I dress, you know, decent and, you know, I, I, I just... If I told you what was going on in my head right now, in reality, you wouldn't believe me. You never know the person that you're talking to, what their struggles are. You never know what they're hiding. And you never know how deep their pain is by just looking at somebody. Brooke Shields revealed to the world her painful struggle with postpartum depression and her use of psychiatric drugs after the 2003 birth of her daughter, Rowan. When someone said to me, postpartum depression, I said, no, those are the women that you hear about in the news that do terrible things to their kids. That's not me. Shields' comments landed the beloved star of film, TV, and stage in a high-profile war of words with another Hollywood heavyweight. The thing that I'm saying about Brooke is that there's misinformation, okay? And she doesn't understand the history of psychiatry. She, she doesn't understand in the same way that you don't understand it, Matt. Aren't there examples, and might not Brooke Shields be an example of someone who benefited from one of those drugs? All it does is mask the problem, Matt. With battle lines drawn, Shields fired back, writing in the New York Times, to suggest that I was wrong to take drugs to deal with my depression, and that instead I should have taken vitamins and exercised, showed an utter lack of understanding about postpartum depression and childbirth in general. You heard Tom Cruise say that, that he feels these antidepressant drugs and psychiatric drugs don't cure the problem, they mask the problem. How do you feel about that? All I know is what worked for me and I went from devastation to a, a non-noticeable uh, contentment <laughs> in, in the sense that there was, it, it, I didn't even know that it was working, it was just that my life had improved and I was able to see my daughter for what she was. While each person's path to recovery will look different, one thing remains true for all perinatal mood disorders. Speaking up and seeking treatment is essential. Keeping your pain inside only makes things worse and can lead to tragic consequences. For a very few women, childbirth or occasionally breastfeeding can trigger postpartum psychosis, a form of mental illness that often includes psychotic episodes, religious delusions, and even violence. The act of infanticide can happen in the most unlikely of families. Angela Thompson, wife, nurse, lifelong churchgoer, and loving mother of daughter Allison. Nine months after the birth of their second child, Michael, Angela began having a series of bizarre religious delusions. She had come to believe that nine-month-old Michael was the devil. So I felt like he needed, I needed to kill him. Angela had no history of violence or mental illness. Nothing in her background gave any clue of what was to come. I was home alone with Allison and Michael, and um, I um, had this revelation of Michael needing to die. And um, I don't know why, but I went into the bathroom and I, I drowned him in the bathtub. I was tried by a judge and found not guilty by reason of insanity. I have consulted and testified uh, mainly for the defense on a number of cases involving either infanticide, neonaticide, pregnancy denial, child abuse, and, or neglect causing death. I served over 17 years in the conditional release program, which is for people who are insane in California. And um, I received treatment, I received education, I received support, and I feel that that is what should happen to women in this situation. And what I really would like to see is that um, we as a nation adopt what's happening in the United Kingdom. Since 1938, England has recognized that childbirth can trigger a temporary insanity. Under the Infanticide Act, if a mother kills her child within a year of giving birth, it is not considered murder. We need to change the law. We need to protect our women. And we need to reevaluate 
those women who are in prison for infanticide. Sonia Hermosillo is a woman who is charged with the murder of her own child. She was someone who suffered from postpartum psychosis. With her other two children, from beginning until this happened, she was a perfect mother. She was fastidious, she was a wonderful um, homemaker. She cooked three meals a day, she sewed their clothing, she loved her children very, very much. She was a wonderful, wonderful mother and a wonderful wife. And a testament to that is how much her husband, who has suffered this enormous, incomprehensible loss, has stood by her side from the very beginning because he knows, he knows better than you and I know, um, that something happened to Sonia when she got pregnant this time. Something went terribly wrong. You can't see a mother who was everything she was in the beginning, um, who commits this horrible act, and think anything other than that she was psychotic. It just doesn't fit. In Orange, California, police are investigating what could have possibly moved a 31-year-old mother to throw her infant son off a parking structure. Okay. Officers arrested Sonia Hermosillo Monday night, hours after witnesses found the seven-month-old boy outside Children's Hospital of Orange County. Neighbors expressed shock about what happened. This woman, who lives downstairs from the suspect, says her neighbor's mood changed soon after the birth of her son. When she arrived to live here, she, I, not, uh, I saw that she was a different person. She was... Serious. She doesn't want to talk to nobody. Just good morning, good morning, bye, hi, and that's it. When you hear about these things and you hear about how many red flags were up and everyone ignored them, I don't for a moment think that anybody around any of the associated professionals didn't care. But I think it's really just an endemic problem. We don't look at postpartum as something that's legitimate. We certainly don't look at postpartum depression as legitimate, I think, in a lot of areas, and certainly postpartum psychosis is something people really don't know much about. So when you have somebody who's showing every sign and making every attempt to get help, um, then I think it's particularly tragic that the baby dies. I mean, it's less about blame for me, really, and it is more about the ability to stop it from happening again. And I don't look at Ms. Hermosillo, like a lot of people do, with postpartum, that it's somehow her fault, that somehow she shouldn't be doing, she's a bad mom if she feels this way. She really has a mental illness. It bothers me greatly that, right. that we have a shortcoming in our healthcare system, which is we're only allowed to hold people for 72 hours, even when they're gravely impaired like this. Maybe you can get them for 14 days, but again, that's very difficult to get. This person went home in an impaired state. She says, my baby's possessed by the devil and I need to get the devil out of it, whatever it might be. And now we're going to encumber the legal system with it and add to the misery of this family. How is that okay? Well, you know, she intentionally killed this baby. With in a psychotic uh, really state, though. Wait a minute, point. Tony. In a psychotic state because of a shortfall of the mental health system. There's so much that can be avoided, so many tragedies that can be avoided if we just recognize the science that exists today. I'm not looking for some new, you know, DNA evidence <laughs> that's going to exonerate my client in this one. I'm just saying the scientists know, but the criminal justice system hasn't caught up with it. In fact, we kind of all haven't caught up with it. I can totally understand why society thinks women like Angela should be in prison the rest of their lives. That's how I was. But then when you learn about what happened, what happens in psychosis and what happens in postpartum depression, you don't have control over your thoughts. In psychosis, you have intrusive thoughts that tell you what to do. That's why we're doing a project like this, to educate and inform. Sonia Hermosillo has been in prison awaiting trial. She's been demonized as a cold-hearted murderer, despite making several attempts to get help for her psychosis before the death of her son, Noe Jr. We wanted to hear her side of the story. So we came down to the Orange County Women's Jail to fill out a media request form to interview Sonia Hermosillo. Um, and once we got there, it turns out all of us need clearance, um, but before we can turn in the clearance papers, we need her to say yes. So they went upstairs and they asked her if she wanted to be interviewed, and she said no.
I mean, basically what it comes down to is she did not know who we were and why we were there. So we need to do over and put our ducks in order and go back in there. And hopefully she'll say yes next time and we'll get the interview. I go to TMS treatment five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday. And um, I drive about an hour in traffic to get there. I'm there for about an hour and then I drive home. I've done about two weeks so far and my head hurts when um, the machine's on my head. It feels like a woodpecker on my head and um, after a while it just really hurts. Um, so sometimes I have to stop and take a break and then the back of my head hurts. If this works, I don't care about the pain. I'll be happy I went through it. If it doesn't work, uh, I'll be devastated. What was it like when you had given birth and the first time that you saw Anna? <laughs> it was, it was amazing. Um, I remember someone saying, she has red hair. And I was just, I'm so happy because I'd always wanted to have a little girl with red hair. I remember that night just breaking down and crying. I didn't, I didn't know why I was crying. I just was completely overwhelmed. I knew something was wrong when I started having thoughts about hurting Anna. A couple of months before that, though, I stopped sleeping and started to um, feel paranoid. I didn't want to live anymore. Like, it was just so exhausting just to get through the day. And I remember thinking, I'm not a good mom. I'm not a good person. I've thought about hurting her. And I think that the only thing that would um, be of any value would be to take my own life and take myself, you know, away from her so that I couldn't hurt her. And um, I just remember um, I went to sleep probably for a couple hours and when I, I woke up so frustrated that I was like, okay, I'm, I, I'm gonna do this. I have a whole bunch of sleeping pills, over-the-counter sleeping pills, and I have some Tylenol. I mean, I never tried to commit suicide before. I didn't know that that wasn't gonna work. Um, but I know that it was real, what I was feeling, and that all I wanted to do was die. Um, so I left a, a note for my parents. Um, I knew that someone would come looking for us the next day if um, they didn't hear from us. And um, so I just went into my bedroom and I took a whole bunch of pills and um, hoping that I wouldn't wake up. So, but I did wake up. And I remember being so frustrated when I woke up, but um, and I thought to myself, I never want Anna to feel this kind of pain. And it wasn't just emotional pain, it was like physical pain and just exhaustion. And I thought if life is hopeless, then, then I'm just gonna save her from it. I'm just gonna have her go to a place where there's no sadness and no pain. And, you know, I always believed that babies go to heaven. And so I really wanted to just save her from a life of pain. And so I remember the next morning when I woke up, going into her bedroom and I put a pillow over her 
face and just held it there until she stopped struggling. And they charged me with first degree murder and child abuse. I had a hearing at a certain point where the state offered me second degree murder. I decided to um, sign that plea. And um, then a month later, I went to sentencing. <laughs> I just remember at the point when I had to stand up next to my attorney and the judge pronounced the sentence, I just, I didn't remember, I don't right now remember anything that he said, except saying that he was sentencing me to 10 years. My parents came to visit me and they said, we think we know what happened to you. And I said, what are you talking about? And they're like, well, we've been doing some reading and we've been talking to people and we think that you had an episode of postpartum psychosis. Everything made sense. All the pieces came together and I understood that I really was ill at the time. Um, the state of Arizona didn't recognize it. Um, they still don't, but I don't really care what the state thinks about me. <laughs> I don't really care what anybody thinks about me except for God and my family. And um, they know who I am, they know my heart, and they know that I would never, you know, hurt her in my right mind. So one of the things on our list is Sonia. Okay, so she is, she's unfit for trial, so now she's in a, like, a, a hospital. Um, so we're not sure if we're gonna be able to interview her, but I talked to Jacqueline about interviewing her husband. So let's call her and follow up and see if this is gonna be possible. Yeah. What was Sonia like as a mother? As a good mother. It's a good mother for my big, my two big daughters, because this is very, very perfect mom for, I don't know what happened for the accident. Just for the, the one day or the other day change everything. See like a different, no, no change the, paper, the pampers, no change nothing. And here, same thing in the hospital, what? What happened, somebody, no, only give me medicine, and uh, everything okay, everything okay, and everything okay, every day, 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 one week. What happened? No, 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 nobody talked to you, you know? Nobody came and talked to you? Mm -mm. No. Was there any mention of postpartum depression? Mm -mm. Mm -mm, nobody. So, nobody, I, I needed to talk because I have something in me inside. This is my wife. So, talk to me, you no. Know? Mm -mm. When your wife was released from the hospital, did, was there follow-ups or did the doctors check in on you or anything like that? And had you at this point knew anything, had you heard, have heard of postpartum depression? Mm -mm. Nobody talked to her, nobody talked to me. I don't know what's going on. When one, one return in a, in a house, I'm looking for my son, I'm looking for my wife, no. I'm gonna go to check it out of my truck. No, my truck's not there. I'm looking for our room, mm -mm. and cable for your cell phone, the cell phone is in the house. So I'm gonna call my brother, I'm gonna call my uncle, hey, you see my wife, you see my wife is not here. I'm gonna tell you, hey, we, we do check it out in the hospital, maybe soon, yeah. Go to the hospital. See, I know. I 
تو کارت الاس بای وفی بایسان این با نارو ارانو بخب Before we got married, we went away for a weekend up the coast. And we went out to dinner. And after dinner, we walked down to the beach. And I remember her and I dancing on the beach, just holding a camera up in the air and taking silly photos of each other. She was so free and so full of laughter That's, that really is my hope, that you know, I can have my little girl back, that, that beautiful softness and just freedom that she had. I just, I hope that returns. When Hunter was a baby, I started saving different like memorabilia stuff because I wasn't doing well and I knew that I wanted to remember certain things because I was in such a bad place that I just, I just started putting things in a box, you know, in hopes that one day I would look through the box and, you know, remember some good times. Mm -hmm. um, this is my first time looking through the box. Wow. This is when he first started eating real food for the first time. <laughs> I don't think too much of it got in his mouth. There's pictures of me laughing. There's pictures of me really enjoying myself, and I didn't know that there were these times. This is a really good therapy for me, looking through this box. It's really good. I don't even remember this. It says, thank heaven for little boys. Wow. I need to read this letter. This is going to be hard to get through. Dear Hunter, you have now been growing and developing inside of me for 39 weeks and two days. We are going to finally meet you tomorrow, but I feel like I know you already so well. We are right now one. When you first started to kick inside of me, I became overwhelmed with so many emotions. Mostly, I fell in love with you. I would lie down on my side, close my eyes, and just feel and be with you. There is no way to describe the bond I feel with you. I know you are going to be a magnificent boy and man. You were created with so much love, baby. Your dad and I prayed for you to come to us. For the first time in my life, I feel complete. I have so many stories to tell you and so much to teach you. I hope I will be the best mom to you, but always know that I am going to try my best and no matter what, I will always love you. As I write this letter to you, I am overwhelmed with emotion. You are my first love that we made together. The day has finally come to meet you. Be strong and I will hold your hand through this life. You are forever loved, love mommy. <sighs> Perinatal mood disorders can affect women from all walks of life. Even Hollywood stars have spoken up about their own personal battles in an effort to raise awareness for this public health issue. After the birth of your son, you uh, suffered from some postpartum depression. Yeah, I think and I the, did. The advice that your doctor gave you knocked my head off. I well, I should say my lovely doctor, but he did, he did make me laugh and he said, you know, I think you need to put on a dress and go to a Broadway show. <laughs> <laughs> I remember thinking, that is the last thing I want to do right now. I didn't know what was wrong with me and nobody had ever talked to me about the possibility of it. First of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about such an important issue. Um, I'm obviously not a legislator. I'm a mother. I'm a mother of two daughters, and after the birth of my first daughter, I suffered acutely from postpartum depression. Now, the biggest tragedy of all of this was that I did not know that I had postpartum depression. I did know that I wanted to die. I did know that I was incapable of holding or looking at or kissing or smelling or singing to my perfect tiny little baby. 
I just couldn't fathom that I would have something called postpartum depression. In 2007, New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez helped introduce the Melanie Blocker Stokes Mother's Act after the loss of Melanie Blocker Stokes to postpartum psychosis. On July 12, 01, as the sun rose over Lake Michigan, my beautiful daughter Melanie stepped out of a 12th floor window to her death. And my heart died that day. The Melanie Blocker Stokes Postpartum Research and Care Act will provide money to groups to educate our communities on postpartum depression. We've made extraordinary changes and advances in this field. The Los Angeles County Perinatal Mental Health Task Force formed in 2007 to remove the barriers to the detection of perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and all of the barriers to treatment. Even though there's still a lot of stigma associated to mental illness, it's less than it was before. I think sharing your story helps women get help that they need. Um, I'm kind of known through my church as like the, the postpartum woman, so someone's like, oh, can I give her your number? You know, she's really struggling. And I'm happy to be that. Like, I'm happy to be there, like through texting even, just I feel like people need a lifeline. I'm very, very happy that I did talk about the postpartum depression, not only for the documentary, but I also let um, Bravo film it for Real Housewives of Orange County, which I was a part of. The outpour of people that reached out to me afterwards was absolutely amazing. I still, to this day, get people that email me or Facebook me, um, tweet me, and they want to know, you know, how can I handle this? What can I do for my postpartum depression? Speaking out and telling my wife's story uh, has been therapeutic for me. It's been difficult, because every time I go back, it just reopens those feelings. Uh, but I think it's worth it to go around and uh, help raise awareness and reduce stigma. It helps me believe that my wife didn't die for nothing, that if her death can result in the prevention of other deaths, at least, it wasn't in vain. When I went um, to Anna's grave the day that I got out, because I knew that that was one of the things that I wanted to do, I. I promised her, I had promised myself a long time ago, but I promised her that um, her death wouldn't be in vain, that there would be purpose, and that I would help other people by sharing our story so that they would know um, what could possibly happen and so that we could just avoid this happening again. In August 2014, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo passed a bill to promote screening and treatment for maternal mood disorders. Many organizations are bringing attention to this issue, even declaring May Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. Postpartum Progress holds an annual event, Climb Out of the Darkness, where families hike or climb to represent their symbolic rise out of maternal mental illness. Events like these and the dedication of numerous organizations and individuals are the key to reducing stigma and getting women the help they need. I'm warmed by the fact that there are conferences, there are journals, um, we're having a conversation, and we need to keep having that conversation. For the women and families that may be battling a perinatal mood disorder at this very moment, the most important message is this. You are not alone. There is help out there, and with that help, you will recover. It's amazing when you share how many stories you'll hear back. I remember when my, when my daughter was two and a half years old is pretty much when it ended. I came off the medication. It took me five months before I stopped hating my husband and thought he was all my problems. And then I, was, I literally was sitting across from dinner with him one night and I said, I'm back. He goes, I, I can tell. When I did go through the worst part of the postpartum depression, I was taking a combination of SAMI, 5-HTP, I took L-theanine, and now I feel a lot of people are reaching out to me and they're learning how to do the natural route when you have depression. 
the antidepressants just didn't appeal to me. So when I went and I saw my nutritionist and he suggested the 5-HTP and the Meta EPO because it was natural, I said, great, I'll go get it right now. And again, very much I think like an antidepressant, it took about two weeks. And then I literally woke up one morning and went, huh, I think I'm gonna be okay. I am very big on hypnosis. I had a, a psychologist that I had seen for many years. I would consult with him and say, look, I'm going in and can we do some of your hypnosis tapes? And I would put the headphones on and it was really a way for me to relax and, and really sort of um, come head on with my anxiety, face to face with my anxiety. I had another baby, which I really didn't think I would or didn't think I wanted to. I was very fearful. What if the postpartum comes back? But I just can't imagine my life without my daughter. And she's amazing. And I hope other women don't let the fear stop them. The benefit outweighs the risk. And like for me, the medication worked and I was able to get on and off of it and didn't have any anxiety or depression. I feel like placenta encapsulation helped a lot after the baby's born, they take the placenta and put it in um, pill forms. I felt good. Like I didn't even feel like just, you know, I'm okay. I felt really good. I went on an antidepressant, anti-anxiety about a month ago and about a week and a half ago, I woke up and I was like, Oh my God, like literally it felt like I was just looking up above the clouds just a little bit. I got pregnant unexpectedly about six years later and it was like going from darkness into light. When I gave birth to Tommy, I felt my whole world had changed. I was so happy. I was delighted. I couldn't believe I had another child another baby, a little boy. And I felt, I really felt like this was my opportunity to, to show that I had, I was a good mom. She's a great mom, um, kept us busy doing, you know, swimming and I was in piano lessons. And... Do you remember when you were first told about Michael? I mean, it was shocking because to hear that story and then compare that to who I know, it's they're polar opposites. They're like that, that's not even possible from the mother that I know, but is also a testament to the strength of character that my mom has. You know, she's such a strong person that even though it's part of her history, it doesn't define her. And what are you most proud of her for? This, her speaking about it. I mean, it's hard to. Do you hear it? Um, sorry. Um, she's very brave. And I'm proud of her for speaking up and not just sitting back and saying, oh, this happened to me and I'm just not gonna talk about it. I'm gonna share this with the world, you know? It's hard to do, it's hard to, I mean, it makes me cry, you know, to think about it, because it's, that takes a lot of strength, a lot of strength and courage. So, very proud of her for that. One of her most endearing qualities is her nurturing character. To my friends, I don't even know if you know this, but I describe her as Mother Goose. She kind of adopts everyone. All children are like her children. She just wants to take care of everybody. So I think it's my favorite quality. I met my fiance and I feel like my life is beginning again. It's time for joy and happiness. For many women that have suffered a perinatal mood disorder, reaching out to other mothers in need is therapeutic and healing. 
we wanted to see how the men and women in this film were affected by sharing their stories. You've all taught me, I mean, about what's important and, and not to care what people think and to really use your voice because your voice can make a lot of change. Is there anyone who would like to say anything? I'm very grateful to you all for sharing my story. It makes me feel like it's all culminated into something really important on a universal level. And I feel an incredible kind of strength about myself that I can impart to my child now. And part of it is a result of the postpartum because I feel like what that did is it blew me into pieces and I got put back together in a much better way. So the hope for me was that I'm a much stronger, happier, healthier person now. I remember sharing my story and then going home and almost just like, you know, 10,000 pounds had come off my shoulders um, to the point where that week in my mommy and me class, I remember speaking up and three other moms finally saying, oh my God, you feel like that too? I think my story that I want to communicate is that there's hope and that postpartum depression doesn't have to come back. I know when I went through it, I couldn't find the information. I just didn't know what was wrong with me. I couldn't understand how I could possibly be feeling the way I was feeling. I definitely appreciate the ladies in this opportunity because it was something I didn't discuss. My mom was shocked. I didn't know you went through so much and you didn't tell me because it was so private. It was so hurtful and I was almost embarrassed. And I'm grateful for my sister joining me here tonight. Mm -hmm. She didn't even know because it's something you don't talk about. It's just like within yourself, it's like I failed or I didn't do something right. So I'm so grateful for the opportunity to share the story and to help many ladies that don't want to talk about it. I always felt that if we have to go through something like this, it has to be for a bigger reason. Mm -hmm. Th there's something more. Life is not just full of sadness. Life is not just full of despair. Life is full of hope. Life is full of what comes out of the darkness. And that's what this film has shown me, that so much comes out of the darkness. You know, out of the darkness for me has come more than just light. I mean, it has changed my life uh, in ways that I could never have imagined. It's so emotional for me to sit here and, and hear everybody's story, because I feel like I've, I've lived alongside all of that. Um, and, you know, I, I can't, I don't know what it's like to feel what all of you felt, but it's really difficult to walk alongside somebody who's feeling like that. And I'm just really thankful. Mm -hmm. What I would want people to walk away with is that it's not your fault. What I hope women will walk away with is that it's okay to ask for help. Just because you're sick with depression doesn't mean you're a weak person. Mm -hmm. And what I learned is that I am sick with depression and I've never realized my strength until now. I, I'm stronger now than I was before depression. I think for me, telling the story or my story was actually realizing um, that I had a story. Um, you know, so often you tuck the football under your arm and you put your head down and you just go. And you're running and you're still running and you're still running, but you don't know why you're running anymore. And I think that for me, telling my story kind of brought me out of the survival mode and into the processing mode. Mm -hmm. Just not even realizing it. I mean, you're the first person that's ever asked me, hey, what did you go through? How did you feel? And I'm like, whoa, you know, we just went through something. I just went through something. Um, so just voicing it has meant so much. And it, it's really, you know, acted as punctuation and kind of put a pause in the sentence and, and really allowed for some some reflection. And it's been good. It's been really good. I hope that they take away that um, we're good mothers with good partners. Um, I've been very Im impressed by hearing Brad share. Uh, yeah. I would hope that my daughter would look for someone like that mm -hmm. in case she gets it too. Mm -hmm.
I was hidden and that was associated with shame. And I learned that we're all amazing and to have conquered conquered this in our journey, it, I'm in awe. I'm in awe of who we are. Mm -hmm. And I can say we, cause it's no longer mm -hmm. me by myself. I'm not isolated. Cause when you are by yourself, it just feels like you're so alone and that you don't matter. But just hearing the stories and that's what I pray that any young lady or husband viewing this would know and understand that you're not alone. And everyone has to have a voice and desires to have a voice and they want to be heard. So no longer are those voices falling upon deaf ears. People are listening. And I just pray and hope that um, the clarity that you're okay will be the message that someone receives. Stacy, to let you know, you did an amazing job. I am so proud that I have an 18 year old niece and I have a 12 year old nephew. And I am proud to be the auntie. And all the time that you forgot, girl, you did awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Someone right now is starting this journey, yeah. right now. And if she gets too far down the road with lack of resources, she'll end up possibly dead, possibly in prison, or possibly in a general psych ward. And that's just not acceptable to me on any level. The criminalization of mental illness in this country and in the world is deplorable. We have so much further to go. The conversation does not end here. That's right. You know, the, the conversation continues. And, you know, for me personally, the Facebook page is, is a community that, that I just adore with all my heart and I'm gonna keep it going forever for as long as I live. And whether we have 3,000 people or 12,000 people or one person left, I'm gonna keep it going and keep the conversation going and do, do my part. What I would love to see happen in the future is some sort of implementation in the healthcare system that there is a screening process for every woman in the world in a way that, if nothing else, to give the woman a heads up that you might possibly be in for a rough journey, and if so, here are some steps you can take, here are things that you can do to help you. Not no, we're so slammed with our health care and you got about 10 minutes, oh, I'm sorry, you just need a little sleep. But a really true good system that could help screen these women. I started as a mother that literally got out of bed, took her son to school, came home, got in bed, got up and tried to do a couple of errands and picked her son up from school and tried to get through the day. And I feel like now I have a little spring in my life again. And I do think that today, sitting here, I'm doing so much better than I was when we started making this film because of everything that I learned and because of all the appointments I've gone to and all the treatments I've done. Each one of them has made me better. As far as I know, we're only given one life. Every day I wake up and see my gorgeous child. That's everything, that's, that, that's my passion. And to be able to change the course of someone's life by just providing information and sharing my story, that's way bigger than me. That's something that like, you can't even put it into words. What do you love most about your mom? Everything. Stay awake for days if that's what you want Be a number one I can fake a smile I can forge 